group. So people working within the AKS product team have definitely recommended this as a place to ask questions and things of that nature. So, um, you know, don't want to paint this as com completely hosted by them, but they will be dropping in to answer your questions, uh, hopefully over the next series of, of sessions. Uh, we will record and I think we just started recording, potentially may have forgotten that this time, but we'll get better at that and make sure at least the, the primary content is recorded. And then if you do have questions or thoughts or even are interested in presenting maybe down the line, uh, then feel free to contact us at this um, this AKS office hours at Microsoft.com. And Dave or myself will get you with whatever those questions might be. Awesome. So now we're going to jump into AKS updates. So I'm going to pass it over to Dave. Yeah, so AKS updates. Uh, if you did attend any of the Ignite sessions, these will probably be what you actually saw there. Uh, but uh, we did GA Azure policy for Kubernetes. Uh, so what this allows you to do is provide policy uh, for your Kubernetes clusters. So think of things like, hey, I want to restrict which container registries uh, that I can pull images from. I can put in a policy there, and Azure policy can uh, block users from pulling from specific registries and only pull ones from the ones uh, that I list that are acceptable. Uh, you could also do things like uh, if a user tries deploy a service with a public load balancer, I could also block things like that. Uh, Azure policy, as you can see here, the screenshot just shows uh, a subset of what is built in uh, for the policies there. Uh, behind the scenes, what we actually use for Azure policy for Kubernetes is what's called the Gatekeeper Project. Uh, it's part of Open Policy Agent. It's a general purpose policy engine. Uh, gatekeepers, the implementation for Kubernetes. Uh, the nice thing about this is that if you're already using Gatekeeper or you plan on using Gatekeeper in another environment, things like that, uh, you can you're using the same policy language here. Uh, so this isn't like some modified forked version for uh, just AKS. Uh, what it's giving you is building that into the AKS policy. Uh, but behind the scenes, it's actually deploying Gatekeeper to your AKS cluster, uh, and you will get a bunch of built-in policies. Uh, one thing I will note on here is things like pod security policies uh, will not GA in AKS, reason being because the upstream is looking at deprecating those uh, with some coming up versions of Kubernetes. And one of those replacements uh, will be Gatekeeper. Uh, so we already have the pod security policies built into here. Uh, so if you're using pod security policies, you may want to look at it uh, using Azure policy for Kubernetes uh, to actually enforce those. Uh, so some things uh, that went in preview uh, yesterday or the day before uh, is the preview for stop and start clusters. Uh, so this is great where you have clusters, maybe development clusters or uh, clusters you're just testing out and you just want to fully stop that cluster, uh, then restart from where you were uh, to save cost. Uh, that feature is in preview now. Uh, there's also a preview for running AKS on Azure Stack HCI. Uh, Azure Stack HCI, essentially what it is, it's a uh, validated hardware by third parties uh, that provides you a way to deploy things like uh, virtual machines in a validated way that are consistent uh, with some of the Azure stuff there. Uh, this now allows you to deploy AKS on that Azure Stack HCI. Uh, so this would be uh, valuable if you're looking at doing some type of on-premises type deployment there. Uh, you also on top of that can deploy different Azure Arc for data services on top of that also. Uh, those things are all in uh, preview currently. Uh, as you'll see, this is not an extensive roadmap discussion we go through. Uh, you can always go and find the full roadmap at aka.ms slash aks slash roadmap. Uh, that will give you very detailed of what's been GA'd, what 
is in preview, things that are in development currently, what's in the backlog. Uh, the AKS product team does a great job of updating that, and you will find tons of information on uh, new features coming or features in development there. Uh, so highly recommend to uh, check out that GitHub repo uh, to check out the roadmap. Uh, there's also a lot of other great stuff there around like uh, releases for AKS and that and what uh, is entailed in that release. Yeah, awesome. And just so you're all aware, I know I mentioned this on the last call for those that were able to join, but in the uh, the repo that also has the calendar invites and all of the updates on each meeting, I've put a list uh, or a section to all of the links that we discuss in each meeting. So there should be links to uh, a lot of the roadmap things that that Dave is mentioning and then a lot of these other things that are mentioned. Casually. So feel free to that moving forward. So now we're going to transition over to ecosystem updates. All right, uh, so a few things on here. Open Service Mesh was accepted into the CNC, CNCF as a sandbox project. If you're not familiar with the terminology, uh, essentially in CNCF, uh, when you donate a project to them, they go through stages uh, of things like sandbox and incubating. Uh, sandbox being the first one, uh, typically how it goes through these stages is based on uh, you know, user base, how many people are using that project and the maturity of that product or project. Uh, Cube Edge was approved as a incubating project. Uh, also, one thing to note, uh, on September 14th, there was a CVE put out uh, for a high security threat. Uh, essentially, the security vulnerability enables unprivileged local process to gain root access. Uh, the container actually has to enable, uh, I believe, net raw, uh, which is not utilized, not needed for most containers to run. Uh, things that would block that would be things like pod security policy. Uh, so you could leverage something like uh, Azure policy for Kubernetes for that. Uh, if you, you will need to update your clusters or uh, make sure that you have the latest security updates applied. Uh, with AKS, we pull down security updates uh, daily, uh, so you should have that, uh, but make sure your clusters don't need, the nodes don't need rebooted in that thing uh, to apply any up security updates that you may have. Uh, and that is it for ecosystem updates, so I will hand it over to Steve. Oh, thanks, Dave. All right, let me take over the share. Let me know if you can see my screen. I see it. Cool. Yep. Thank you. All right, I'll bring the chat up here so I can see it as well. Um, cool. Thanks, everybody. Uh, just to introduce myself, part of the same team as, as Kendall and Dave, so the Cloud Native Global Black Belt team. Uh, you can see my info right there. Uh, I'm helping customers. Uh, formerly, I was uh, part of the customer success unit uh, within uh, Microsoft covering media accounts. So uh, I've done a lot of work in networking and infrastructure and so forth. Uh, and I'm realizing now I need to get legal ruled paper so I can like hide some of my desk here. Uh, I did promise uh, some people some terrible drawings, so you can look forward to that. Uh, the topic that we're going to go through here today is AKS and Azure Active Directory integration. Um, you can see it's an AKS here, and this is a, a perfect uh, drawing of, of myself, as you can see there. Before we get into AKS and AAD integration, though, I think it makes sense to first lay down some foundational topics. And this is going to sound kind of remedial, but the reality is most of the times that, that I talk to customers about AAD integration and AAD in general, uh, there's a lot of confusion around the difference between authentication and authorization, right? So I want to lay down that foundation here right now. So um, first of all, we talk Oops, Steve, we lost you. So you're talking on mute right now. Not sure if that was an accident or not. Oh, there we go. Nope, that's weird. It just okay. auto-muted itself. Cool. Um, where did I drop? Was I already talking about authentication? <laughs> Basically, right when you flipped over to this page, really. Interesting. Cool. I wonder if like my camera somehow auto-muted me. Strange. Okay. Um, so yeah, you know, wanted to lay down some foundations around authentication and authorization because again, this is this is something that commonly is misunderstood how this works. 
um, and, and what these components entail. Uh, and it, it, it's significant in how this gets implemented within Kubernetes, right? So on the authentication side, you're talking about who you are, right? So multi-factor authentication, identifying that an individual actually is who they are. Uh, and this is typically handled uh, in Azure Active Directory through something like, uh, you know, uh, OAuth, right? So there's a, there's a set of flows that you go through to identify an individual, right? Uh, if you take kind of a real world scenario, you know, the real world scenario is, hey, who am I? You know, my passport indicates who am I. It has my, my height, my eye color, a picture of myself, right? Uh, authorization, on the other hand, is what can I do, right? So uh, looking on the right-hand side here, I'm a, I'm a developer, right? So that's, that's my role. And, and as a developer, I have certain things that I can do. Or if you're talking about kind of in a real world scenario, you know, I go to the airport and I want to get on a plane. Well, the TSA agent is going to look at who I am and, and what's on my passport and say, you know, are you authorized to actually go through security, right? So that's the authorization side of things. Um, and this is implemented in Kubernetes in this way, you know, like my, my sweet fly in transition there. Um, so again, I mentioned on the left-hand side, we have Azure Active Directory, right? So Azure Active Directory is using OAuth2 and OpenID Connect to, to basically capture not only who you are, but some attributes about you, right? So the OAuth2 is, is doing the verifications, doing the authentication flow. You'll hear flows referred to a lot. You'll hear about device flows and things like that. If you go and look at the Azure Active Directory page, you'll see a listing of all the different flows that you could possibly go through. And depending on the type of user, service principle versus a user, there's a lot of different flows that you have at your disposal. And then OpenID Connect is what gives a bunch of attributes, right? So you can have role information, you can have information about you know, uh, what your email address is, first name, you know, family name, all these different things or attributes within there, okay? Uh, but ultimately, if you're trying to, to make an authenticated call to a Kubernetes API, you're going to use this OAuth flow to make that call to the API. The API is ultimately looking for a, uh, a JWT, a JSON web token, okay? And the way that works is if we kind of go through the flow here, Right, so I'm in Kubernetes and I'm running kubectl and I say, hey, kubectl, get pods, okay? So kubectl tries to talk to the Kubernetes API server and it says, hey, get pods. Kubernetes API server says, hold on, wait a second. You know, you need to give me a JSON web token first. You need to give me something that indicates that you've been authenticated, right? Because I don't handle authentication. I handle authorization. Authentication is delegated elsewhere, right? So it comes back, gives me a URL, says, hey, go out to this URL and do your authentication flow is going to be to Azure Active Directory, right? So this is going to take me over to login. So I say to Azure Active Directory via this URL, hey, can I have a JSON web token for my Kubernetes API server? Azure Active Directory says, yeah, uh, hold on a second. You need to go through some flows to, to do that, right? And again, this is where I mentioned there's a lot of different OAuth flows at your disposal. The one that we most commonly come across is kind of the web, interactive web authentication flow, um, right? But in in the Kubernetes world, it's actually gonna send you through a device login flow. Now the device login flow will look familiar to you if you've ever done like, you know, adding an account to your Roku or your Apple TV, right? It basically says, hey, go to this URL and use this code, right? So you, you get a code, you go to the URL, and then you're gonna run through your normal Azure Active Directory sign-in in this case, right? So whatever your enterprise says you need to do, right? If it's, hey, you got multi-factor through the Authenticator app or whatever it is, it's gonna take you through that flow and then eventually Azure Active Directory to say, cool, I've verified who you are, who I expect you to be, and it's gonna give back that, that JSON web token, which I can then send across to the Kubernetes API. Kubernetes API says, okay, well, let me check this web token out. It's valid, it's from you know, a trusted identity provider. It's got a claim in there, so it's got an audience in there that indicates that it was intended for me. Right? So if you look at a JSON web token, which we'll take a look at in a little bit, you'll see there's an audience that basically is an indicator of who this was generated for. So it says, yes, this is a valid token for me. Uh, and then it goes out to etcd. It's going to check roles, right? Because now we're getting into the authorization side, right? We've done the authentication side. Now Kubernetes is responsible for doing the actual authorization. So it's saying, hey, this user, do they have a valid role in the system? So you'll see this if you're using Kubernetes integrated authentication, you can authenticate, you can make a call to Kubernetes, and then you'll get forbidden because it's, it's when it actually goes to check Kubernetes to see if you're authorized to do certain things that it says, oh yes, you are an admin, and then it can ret return your pods, okay? Any questions on that flow? And this is pretty much the same flow for any Azure AD integrated app, really for any OAuth2 uh, uh, application flow. So Cube API validates the token? 
validates is a strong word. It, it checks to make sure that it's it's the the token for the audience. You know, it it, okay. it the, the audience is for the Cube API. So I mean, you can say validates, but that that indicates maybe it's doing a little more than you'd expect. It's really just looking at the token and saying, hey, you know, is this the right token for me? Right? Um, and is it from my trusted provider? Gotcha. So it, in another way, is that the the Cube config um, authorizing against the Cube API to the database? Yeah, effectively. And you'll see this when we get into the demo. You'll see that the the um, Kube config has an access token in it. Well, the access token is the JSON web token. Okay. Uh, cool thing to to think about here, though, that you can that you can do with an Azure AD enabled cluster, or again, any OAuth, is you can actually you know take Kube CTL out of here and plug in any other application. Maybe you've built your own uh, CLI tool to integrate with Kubernetes. You can use this exact same flow because you can say, "Hey, Azure Active Directory." I need to get a token for, for my application. And assuming you've done the pre-configuration to enable that, you can get tokens for your application. Uh, and you can actually get tokens on behalf of users. So if you go take a look at OAuth2 on behalf of, you'll see there's a specific flow dedicated to you know, people who are acting as intermediaries, right? So if I'm you know, trying to get to the, the Kube API over here and I have an application, maybe it's a bot, right? right? And then I have my, my user over here, that I can basically say, hey, you know, uh, bot call out to here and get a token on behalf of OBO that I can then use to call my API server. So having this integrated flow, this, you know, this standard OAuth2 capability built in starts to open up a lot more interesting scenarios, what you can do uh, with, with the Kubernetes API uh, if you're trying to build your own custom tools. And there's a, uh, there's a set of code that, uh, that Lynn Oral had, had put together. I was going to try to get it running for today, but didn't have time, uh, but it's basically doing exactly that. So it's creating a, a bot that you interact with that's actually making API calls against the Kubernetes API, but authenticating as the user all of the things you're trying to do. So if you try to get nodes and you're not authorized to get nodes, you're not going to see those nodes. Okay. Um, so with that, let's actually jump in. You know, I have a, a bunch that I wanted to show you. We're going to talk about do a bit of a demo. So I'm going to show uh, a demonstration of kind of default out of the box Kubernetes authentication authorization that you'll get with Azure. So if you don't do any Azure AD enablement and what that looks like. Uh, and then we'll actually jump in and we'll do uh, the AED enablement. All right. All of the stuff that I'm running through today, excuse me, I have a drink of water, is up on GitHub. I, I scripted it all out so that you can just execute it yourself. Uh, so I'll be running through these, but I will walk through each script and explain what's happening here, okay? So basically what you can see is, you know, I'm using the script to manage environment variables. I'm creating clusters. I already did steps zero and one here. Uh, and we're going to move over to uh, to step two, right? Uh, so with step two, what I wanted to show, if I if I jump into into step two here, I'm doing a user compare, right? So I've created, if I look here, if I do an AZ AKS list, I've created two clusters. Okay, and one of them is AD enabled, one of them is not. So cluster and demo cluster dash AAD. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is I want to see, you know how the authentication works for those uh, for those default clusters. Now, if you've looked at Azure AD, um, sorry, if you've looked at uh, you know, Kubernetes authorization in AKS before, you'll know that there's two users that are created, right? So there is a admin user that you can get by applying the dash admin flag. Uh, and then there's a cluster user that you can get by using the, the cluster user flag. So the question is, and this is the out of the box, you don't have to do anything to get this. The question is, what's the difference between these two users, right? On the Azure Resource Manager side, there's a difference in what those users can do, right? As far as one has the ability to manipulate your, your clusters and, and so forth. But what about internal to, to Kubernetes, right? So what can these individuals do within the cluster? So what we're going to do here is we're going to make a temp directory. We're going to get credentials for each of these. And we're basically just going to go and uh, read the certificate. So if we take a look at this really quick, let me clear here. And let's, uh, let's take a look at my kube config file. So let's take a look here. So I've already preloaded these, okay? And you'll see there's a bunch of stuff in here, but you can see I have a couple users loaded up down here. Uh, so if we look at this first user, you can see I have this certificate data. Well, first of all, let me go to the beginning here. You can see at the top here, you know, we always have our certificate for interacting with the cluster. But then you'll notice there's a certificate for each user. Well, what's that certificate actually used for? So let's grab this and let's go check out, um, you know, I don't recognize what this is. So I, I think it's base64 encoded. So let's, let's decode this, this value. So again, you can all do this yourselves right now. I'm just decoding and you can see, look, hey, this is a certificate. This is a, just a base64 encoded certificate. What if I want to read the certificate, right? So decode, 
my certificate. Let's open this link up, paste it in here, decode it. Okay, so you can see I'm actually able to look at the certificate. You can see there's a subject, there's a common name and organization. Okay, cool. So there's some information in there that I can possibly use. Okay, so let's see what Kubernetes is actually doing with these. So they kill this and let's fire off uh, script two. And actually, before I do that, so once it gets these values, it's just going to decode those and dump those out to a file. So there's a user file and an admin file. And it's just going to diff those two files to see if their certs are the same. All right, so I'm going out, I'm getting my credentials for each cluster. And you can see I diffed them, no results. It's because those files are identical. There's no difference between those two files. So what does that tell me? That tells me that the admin user and the kube user, sorry, the, the, the cluster user and the cluster admin are the same user, right? So as far as Kubernetes is concerned in this in this example. And if I take a look, you know, we saw that the it was you know, master client, I think is what it's called. If I take a look at, let's do K uh, get uh, cluster role bindings. All right, I take a look at, there's a cluster admin role, right? So it's clear here. Let's K describe, let's get cluster role binding. Okay. You can see that the name, it's a group and the name is system masters. Well, you might recall, I think I already closed it, but you might recall, I think I can actually cat the file. So it's cat admin, uh, temp admin. If I scroll up here, you can see that the, where is it? Right here. The organization is system masters, right? So that's where it's making the association. So when this call comes in with this certificate, Kubernetes is able to go and say, okay, well, the organization is system masters, and I have a cluster role binding, which is a role that applies to the entire cluster for that user, and that is the cluster admin role. Cool? All right. So, so now we know that that user is the same either way. So let's take a look at um, creating a kube user. So how could I actually, if I want to create my own users, again, this is not yet integrating Azure AD. This is just kind of showing you the pain that you'd have to go through if you want to manage your own users without Azure AD enablement. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through, I'm just going to load some environment variables, ignore that. I'm going to create a cert directory. I'm going to generate a certificate. Okay. I'm going to request uh, a new cert. Okay. I'm going to put that cert into, I'm going to create a cert signing request within Kubernetes. I'll approve the cert. All right. So you can see this is already kind of a pain. This is for one user, right? And that user is called Griffith, right? So it's going to do a cert uh, signing. It's going to approve that. And then it's going to go create a role, right? So here I'm creating a, uh, a role. And I'm assigning that to uh, that username, to that Griffith user. And then I'm just here, I'm just setting the, the cube uh, context. So let's run this. What was it called? It was called uh, three. All right. <clears throat> All right, cool. So now I've gone and created that user. Uh, I can go and execute commands using that user. Let's actually go and uh, let's say K get pods. Okay, so I'm able to do that, but if I do K get nodes, I'm not authorized to do that, right? So I'm checked in as my Griffith user, and you can see I'm, I'm restricted access. Now let's actually compare those two files. If I do uh, like an LS, I think it was uh, compare custom. So we'll do dash four. Okay, so now I'm just going to get those credentials and I'm going to compare these values. And here you can see once this comes up, but again, the subject is actually different, right? So this compared with the other users I have is going to have a different subject, okay? So that's kind of the basics of if you're trying to do your own, um, you're creating your own just via certificates, it's kind of a kind of a hassle. Uh, and the worst part of it is that's just a file. I could send that file around anywhere. That, that cert, you know, it's not going to expire, you know, for a long time. I could basically take this file, I could, I could post this file into our chat right now, and you could all access this cluster directly. There's really nothing stopping. There's no multi-factor authentication, no nothing. Okay. So let's jump back over here. So we've gone through the user custom. Um, let's go and let's actually do an Azure AD um, authentication. Okay. So I created my kube user. I'm going to go and I have a couple manifests in here that I'll show you. So I do have an Azure AD enabled cluster. What I'm going to do is first let's sign into that. So let's do CTA. I'm going to go to the AED cluster here and let's do K get pods. Okay, so you can see it's going to try to prompt me to get in. I'm going to grab this. 
And by the way, to do this, to create this cluster, all I did was, if I, if I show you back here on the cluster creation, the only difference is enable AAD, right? So you can see it's the exact same cluster creation command with enable AAD. Now over here, I'm getting prompted to enter my code and I'm gonna choose my account. And now in a second, you should see a response come back. Cool, so you can see this user is not authorized. So even though I'm authenticated, I successfully authenticated the cluster, I couldn't actually execute any operations because I didn't go into Kubernetes and say, you know, what rights do I have? So let's go and do that. So I have over here an admin cluster role binding. So again, cluster role binding applies to the entire cluster. I'm just gonna reuse that same cluster admin role that's used by uh, the out of the box users. In this case, I'm gonna set, you know, the subject who this should apply to is myself, but this could be a group, right? So you could have multiple teams uh, with different, different access uh, and you just apply their group here instead. So in order to apply a role, I need to actually be an admin. So you may have noticed here when I created the cluster, I jump back to create cluster. Um, I also got the credentials for admin, right? So there is a flag. If you do AZAKS get credentials, you can say, hey, give me the admin credential. Even if it's an Azure AD enabled cluster, you can still get that admin credential. So let's do this, let's CTX. Let's jump in as admin here, okay? So now I should be able to, okay, kubectl apply, uh, manifest, and it is Griff admin. Okay, so let's switch back. Okay, so now let's, okay, get pods. Okay, you get notes, whatever I want uh, on this cluster. Okay, uh, now what about, how does this actually look? So let's, let's take a look at this uh, kube config file. So let's uh, code. All right, so you recognize most of this, but let's scroll down and take a look at the one that we just added. Right, so you notice that this one is not like the others, right? And I'm going to delete this cluster, so you know if you get anything unique from from here that you can use. All right, so oops, sorry. So what I have here is a access token. So what's an access token? Well, an access token we talked about this already. It's a JSON web token. So I can take that value right on my kube config file, go to jwt.io, and let's decode this this job, right? So you can see this access token has all this information in it about. So this is you know, the combination of OAuth and OIDC data that, that Azure Active Directory is providing to the cluster. So when we talk about that validating of the token, what's doing is it's looking at this, it's decoding it and saying, okay, well, let's, let's check and make sure, you know, is the proper audience here? So the audience uh, is right here. Is this the right ID? Is this the right audience for us? And then it's going to go and, and grab some information that can then be used by Kubernetes to actually check that user. To authenticate with uh, my own user, right? With the, sorry, with an Outlook or a Hotmail user. So let's kill this and let's jump in here. And let's again, let's go, uh, okay, get nodes. Okay, it's gonna prompt me again to log in. I'm gonna do this. I should have to do this in the incognito window. So give me a second. So what you can't see is over on the side here, I'm signing in with my Hotmail account. My password. Oh, no, it's already, it's already set. There it is. Okay. So I've authenticated on the left-hand side here to my uh, Hotmail account, and you can see that it didn't, it didn't connect there. So the question is, you know, look at this, this is a user. This isn't saying Steve Griffith at hotmail.com, right? It's using a different identity. So if I go back here and let's take a look at, I'm gonna create a demo reader role, right? So this is just a basic reader. So it's gonna be able to read pods, get list, watch pods, and I'm gonna do a demo role binding. Now the difference here is this is a role binding versus cluster role binding. So role bindings are bound to specific namespaces, right? So I'm gonna set this on the demo namespace. Uh, and in this case, you can see here, I have, you know, steve.w.griffith.hotmail. Well, that's not gonna work, right? Because it's not looking for that. It's not seeing that. That's not the value it's pulling out of the claim. It's actually pulling this value, which you can actually see in the error. It says, hey, there's no user D984. All right, so let's save this. Um, again, I'm gonna have to switch back to my Azure AD, right, my admin credential. And then let's do this, okay, apply. 
uh, manifest demo, and it's uh, well, what did I call it? I called it demo reader. Sorry, demo reader role. So I'm going to create the role, and now I'm going to apply the uh, role binding as well. Oops, and it's yelling at me because I didn't create the namespace. Let's do that. Let's, let's try it again. So let's go back. CTX again. Now, if I K get nodes, I should still get an error because I don't have access to that. But if I K get pods for the namespace demo, no resources found in the namespace. So I'm good there. Okay. All right. So the last thing I want to show within here. So now we've, we've run through, you know, what is it? You know, what does authentication look like if you're not using Azure Active Directory? We've run through what does it look like and what do the roles look like if you are using um, but there's one more thing that's really interesting about using Azure Active Directory integrated authentication is, um, first of all, if you go and look at the documentation for it, so we jump out here and take a look, you can actually see there's two different versions of it, legacy and managed, right? Well, so legacy, if you ever went through this before, looks a lot like if you were manually setting up any OAuth enabled service, right? So you have to go when you're, let me switch over to this view again, <clears throat> when you're running through this, right? Every actor in this flow has to have an identity, right? So here is my, you know, hotmail.com or my Microsoft account. This has an identity that's represented by an app registration in Azure Active Directory. So you have to have an identity that represents the calling application uh, in addition to the user. And then you have to have an identity that represents the API that you're trying to protect, right? And that's another app registration. So you have a user, app registration, app registration. So in the if you go and try to go through this legacy flow here, you'll actually see it has you go through that, has you create the server component, has you create the client component, right? So has you create all of those identities? That's fine, except now you're responsible for those, right? So as the secrets for those expire, they need to be rotated. Um, you know, those secrets are something that could potentially leak if someone puts that into an automation script. So it's kind of, you know, it's a bad idea to do that. So the managed approach, this is the new approach that rolled out, allows you to basically just flip that flag. So dash dash enable Azure AD, boom, it's all done for you. It's all using managed identities for you. You don't have to worry about the rotation of it. It's all kind of magic, right? And you get the same experience. In fact, what I found is this actually works in a lot of cases for customers who have locked down their Active Directory. If you have a highly locked down Active Directory, which I hope you do, um, you may not be able to go through the legacy flow, but you may have the rights to go through this flow because it's using managed identities, which a lot of Azure Active Directory admins are a little bit more cool with letting you do. Um, <clears throat> so um, run through this flow. And the other thing I wanted to show here is actually, this was just announced this week at Ignite. I'm still pending for the preview, but what you can actually do is rather than having to uh, manage the roles in AKS, like I demonstrated, uh, you can actually do this uh, via Azure Active Directory itself. So you can actually create roles within AAD that represent, if I scroll down here a little bit further, what a user has rights to do. It's a little bit limited right now, but you can see you can actually create a Azure Active Directory role that will you know, basically translate in directly into Kubernetes role. So you wouldn't have to go through and create those cluster roles and cluster role bindings. Um, but the last thing I wanted to show here actually was, um, I was talking about the legacy versus the new version. One additional thing that came with the implementation of what we call AADB2 is the ability to do a service principle based authentication. Okay. And that's done through something called kube login. All right. So kube login is a, I mean, you could, you could write this yourself. And there's, you know, again, this is just OAuth books, but this is an implementation of an authentication provider. So think about the scenario where you've enabled Azure Active Directory on a cluster and you need to do automated deployments to it. Well, if you try to do automated deployments, you're gonna end up getting a login request. You're gonna to have to get that device login flow. Well, your, your pipeline's not gonna be able to do that. Whatever, whatever pipeline it is, is gonna have a challenge doing that. So you need a way to do a non-interactive login. So what kube login lets you do, and Azure AD v2 and AKS, allows you to actually do this non-interactive or interactive flow, right? So I have a script that runs you through this as well. Oops. So if you look at kube login, and this is basically straight out of the documentation, right? So again, I'm just gonna load some environment variables. I'm going to create a service principle, okay? The app ID, password for that service principle. 
and put them into a couple environment variables. I need to grab the object ID as well, because again, when you're, you know, you noticed when I was creating the cluster role bindings, you often need to use an object ID for that. So I have to grab that object ID. And basically what I'm doing here, just to prove that it works, is I'm, I'm clearing out my kube config and getting it again with the admin. I'm just gonna apply this cluster role binding with that user. So I'm gonna grant this service principle cluster admin rights, right? So you can see I'm just passing in that object ID, okay? Again, I'm going to clear that kube config, right? Because I, I, I got the admin credential. I want that to be gone. I'm going to get the non-admin credential, okay? And then I'm actually, there's a step here that you have to run through to, to convert your kube config to support this. So you run kube log, convert config, and then you should be able to get nodes. So let's do this. What number was that? That was five. All right, so here I'm creating a service principle. Create the cluster role binding, boom. So now I'm able to go in. So that was without any interactive. So this is still going against an Azure Active Directory enabled cluster, but you notice I didn't have to jump out into that device login flow. So this is the route that you would take if you're implementing this in your you know, CI CD pipelines or automation tools, whatever they may be. All right, anything else? I think that was everything that I wanted to show. Um, so you can open up for some questions. I know there's some stuff in the chat. I see uh, Ray and the team were responding, so thank you. Everyone's still able to hear me, I assume? Yep. All right, I was just talking to the ether for a uh, yeah, Steve, it looks like some of the questions are coming in as well. Sure. So I saw the one, the link to the repo. Uh, I need to put a readme in there, so apologies. It's kind of rough right now, but you should be able to work through it. So I'll post this into the chat right here. All right. What's the difference between cluster role and admin role? So cluster role and admin role from an Azure resource manager perspective, uh, you have different capabilities, right? So um, let's see, uh, if I look it up, AKS. Cluster admin role. All right, so there's a doc that explains uh, the capabilities there. I think that this one will run you through it. There, All right. So there, there is a difference from an Azure Resource Manager perspective, right? Uh, but ultimately, the kube config is the same. You saw the kube config was effectively identical, with the exception of one is called cluster admin and one is called cluster user. Um, so that's really the difference there. Um, so it's really the ability for you know management of the of the cluster if you get the cluster admin role versus basically just being able to get the kube config, right? Because even with Azure AD enabled uh, clusters, you still need to do the AZ AKS get credential. And why do you need to do that? Well, because the file has the cluster certificate so and the server name. So this information that you need to actually talk to the cluster, you still have to do an AZ AKS get credentials. But then beyond that point, you're using Active Directory authentication. All right, what other questions? All right. Authorization for a given user. How does the cluster identity identify the user? For authorization again, how does it? Okay. Yeah, so etcd doesn't store, there is no concept in Kubernetes of a user object, right? You can't go kubectl get users, right? Um, it, it actually gets the information based on um, the cluster role binding itself. Right, so the cluster role binding is where you actually specify, if I jump back into here, what the subject is. So this is the binding between uh, the identity that's coming in on the request and what they can do. Right, that's, that's really all that you, you get access to. So the cluster identifies the user um, by either that, that you know, CN and O value in the certificate or in the Azure Active Directory enable uh, the, the value from the, uh, the JWT. All right. Yeah, it, it is kind of confusing. There's permissions done in different places. Yeah, I think that the, you know, and this is why that, that feature out of the Azure uh, AKS team is coming where you can actually manage them all out of AKS, uh, sorry, all out of Azure uh, Active Directory. Uh, then you would have that consolidated view. But as it stands today, the way to think of it is if you're doing operations against AKS, 
as in management operations against the infrastructure, then you'll do those things within you know Active Directory role definitions. If you're doing things, if you're trying to manage what you can do within the cluster itself, so Kubernetes resources, those are through Kubernetes role bindings and cluster role bindings. Okay, can this mechanism leveraged by service meshes to pass user context? Getting a bunch of chats here. I just... All right, so I'm trying to read this one. Uh, there we go. Can this mechanism also be leveraged by service meshes to pass user context from front end to back end services to dependent back end services? I mean, it's all ultimately OAuth too. Uh, I guess the question would be, you know, what we're talking about here is more cluster management and Kubernetes resource management more so than application authentication, right? So once you get into the application level, you would like to implement your own OAuth within there as well. And you can still use Azure, Azure Active Directory for that OAuth, but that would be more about your application authentication. So yeah, service meshes could use OAuth 2 for service to service authentication possibly, uh, but that would be a level kind of below what we're talking about here. Okay, so I'm getting a weird behavior where I get kicked out after a certain idle time and then simply authenticating doesn't do the same job. I have to get credentials again and start from scratch. And you know, I'm not aware of an issue there, um, but we can take a follow up on that and see. Um, you know, it's likely that something going funky with your refresh token, maybe something's tweaking your, uh, your kube config file that's causing issues. Um, yeah, Steve, there was an issue with that. Uh, it had to do with versions of kubectl and Helm, actually. Uh, I'll link issue in the chat for it. Cool. Thanks, Dave. All right. What's the fastest way to know who can do what in a <laughs> this is a tough question, man. This this one's come up and I know that Kevin Harris, I'm not sure if he's on the line, was was digging into this as well. Um, I don't know that there's really it, it's kind of a painful process to to find out what cluster role bindings are in there. And then you kind of have to walk it backwards. So like maybe there's someone else on the line who knows a better answer for this. But I know that a couple of people have looked into it and have not found a really good way to get an identity, you know, identify what users can do what within a within a cluster. And this isn't an AKS specific thing. This is just, you know, Kubernetes doesn't really have a good mechanism for really giving that full listing of everything that someone could do, at least to my knowledge. And again, maybe someone else has some some info there they can share. Yes, the, uh, there's no UI to show the effective policies right now. Uh, like you you said, that's a broader Kubernetes ecosystem thing. Like there's no command that you can run that does a diff and shows you what uh, policies will clobber the other one and show you what the, the net result is. That's right. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, is there an update coming to support this from Azure Cloud Shell? Because there's a min kube CTL version of uh, 18. Um, so that's for, I imagine you're, you're asking that question in regards to the uh, the new RBAC enabled capability. So I'm not sure if someone's on who can speak about the Azure Cloud Shell version and, and when the next version of kubectl will be available. Uh, the other capabilities that I ran through should work fine. Uh, I believe kube login, last I tried, worked unless there was a recent change uh, from the Cloud Shell. Uh, it's just that new feature around Azure Active Directory enabled um, integration for creating roles. So that's creating roles in AAD that then trickle down into your cluster, right? Uh, what we talked about, you know, Primarily was actually authenticating to a cluster, um, but the role management was still in the cluster. The the new capability is what requires a team, uh, and I'm not sure what the timing is in that. All right. Did I miss anyone? Uh, is it feasible to integrate with IoT devices? Um, I mean, it's OAuth, right? So if you're anything that can handle an OAuth flow can handle integration. You can do this through curl. Uh, in fact, I've done that a few times. Is actually do an authentication flow through curl with Azure Active Directory where you go and, and ask AAD for a jot for your cluster, uh, and then you pass that to the Kubernetes API and you're good to go. So yeah, certainly anything that supports REST API calls, uh, you can you can use this for. And there's SDKs for AAD, uh, all of it that you can leverage. Um, let's see. So, so we can give access only to see the pods with a Hotmail ID demo and not the permission to get notes, correct. Yeah, so if you look at, if I take a look at, uh, this was the min read role. So here I'm getting specifically a, you know, a role that says you can, well, this one's saying nodes and pods, but you could take nodes out of there and it would work fine. Um, in this case, I'm applying it to a specific, so I was looking at the wrong one, here we go. This is the one, right? So this is just getting pods. 
applying it to a game space. All right. Where can we create a role assignment for a namespace with this role? Yeah, so this is, again, this is the new capability. I have not gotten to test it out. So this is the being able to manage roles within Azure Active Directory. So what we showed so far was enabling authentication with Azure Active Directory, enabling roles. Uh, that I've not gotten to test yet. So I'm still in a pending state for that feature. Uh, but my understanding is that you should be able to, to specify um, you know, which namespace within that role configuration somewhere in Azure Active Directory. And again, maybe someone else who's gotten access to that uh, can share how that works. All right. Okay, so we use AZ login identity from Azure VM with a MSI and get the kube config forever. A do uh, will the new method require some refresh? Uh, yeah, so I'd say you know with the new approach, I, I would recommend you switch to the new approach first of all because you're going to want to have those managed um, server identity, right? So you're going to have the managed identities for everything. So you don't have to deal with the rotation, and then you could just swap out your current approach to kube login. So it should make your script a little bit more simple. Uh, I imagine that your current approach should continue to work. Um, I've not tested with, with that model that you've shared there, uh, but certainly uh, the newer cut down the amount of code that you have to write. All right, so updated kubectl in the cloud shell should be available soon. Thank you, Larry. All right. Is the authorization only at the user level? No, you can do group as well. So this, you can see the subject I have selected here. You can also specify groups. So you can have an Azure Active Directory group. Say you have a, a namespace per development team. You can have a group aligned with that, assign users to that group. And then here you would change the kind to be group and you'd give the object ID for the group. That's it. And the object ID you can just get from, you know, from the entry in the Azure Active Directory portal. In fact, if I come out here and let's look at this and I go to Azure Active Directory, I can bring up my um, Hotmail object ID. So here's the object ID. So it'd be the same, you look at the same thing for groups and you grab the group ID there. All right. Debug kubectl auth operations against AD. Is there any other way besides kubectl v9? That I'm not sure about. I'm not sure if anyone else has. I mean, I've always done my my debugging basically by looking at the kube config file itself and looking at the values in there. I've not gone into kubectl itself and tried to debug. I don't know if anyone else has experience with that. No, we'll have to, we, we can follow up on that. I, I'm not sure if there's a, another way to do that. Cool. Well, thanks, Steve. I know that I know that we only have five minutes left, so just do do want to close out a little bit. I know today we didn't have as much time for the open ended questions, but I do think we got a lot a lot of questions on this topic. So that's great. Once again, if you do have really pressing questions, feel free to send those to our distribution list or join the next call. So just want to call that out really quickly. I'm going to share my screen just to make sure that everybody knows where they can find things because I have seen a few things on our on the YouTube channel and things like that that are uh, that are asking where they can find some of this. So um, the link is just uh, aka.ms backslash AKS public office hours. So I'll drop those again. Um, but this is actually where we're going to put whatever the next topic we're going to cover is. So we're still determining what will be on the 8th, but we should have a presentation then ready for all of you. Uh, I'm also going to create a poll or some type of Microsoft form so that we can get some of your feedback around topics that you're interested in hearing. Uh, but I mentioned this before. We didn't have any previous meetings, so I couldn't really completely walk through it. But um, all of the presentations are going to be on the GitHub page, along with all of the recordings for the uh, for the YouTube channel. So all of these are totally accessible to you. Feel free to drop in. Um, I'll make sure that they're all, uploaded. And all of that's oh, going to. Sorry about that. I'll make sure that they're uploaded within you know an hour or so after the call, so that you're not waiting on the. So just keep that in mind. And then we also have, as I mentioned, if I can get back where I was. Let's see here. Let me pull that up. Um, on the 
GitHub page, we also have a link to all of the um, public office hours, a link to all of the links that we mentioned. So I'll go through and skim through the, the chat today and add all of those to this page. But if you look under AKS resources, you can click here and that's where all of the um, all of the links will be that we reference. So keep that in mind in case you do want to know or go back and don't have to peruse through the chat. Uh, so yeah, just wanted to call those things out. And also on here is also a calendar invite. So if you didn't have this as a reoccurring invite, feel free to download that. And if you want to send it out to other people on your team, you can also download the invite templates. So I just wanted to go through that to make sure everybody knew uh, where to go for that information. But thanks again, Steve. It was awesome. No problem. Thank you. Anything else from your side, Dave? No, I think we cover it. Cool. Great, everyone. Well, thanks again for joining. And once once again, please send over any feedback that you have, be it positive or constructive. We'd love to hear it. And we look forward to seeing y'all on the 8th of October. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. That's great.